Here we go. So we are, um, we are, what is today? Week nine. So we are over the hump. We are halfway through the course. This is the respiratory. Uh, yes, we are in gas laws. Gas laws are a huge part of physics and for physiology play a big role in certain areas of our body. And so having that tie in, it's yes, a great way to ask you in a written manner to demonstrate you understand some respiratory physiology by applying a gas law, which is physics and physiology together. So to answer a question from a student, would these be potentially some essay questions on our next test? Yes, because this would be a great way to show me that you understand a physics concept and a physiology concept and applying them together. All right, that's integration there, some application. Okay, so we've hit Hill's law, we've hit ventilation, all right? And the next big law we have to hit on is Dalton's. Now, just to give you some perspective, Charles's law is a law you may never have to worry about because it's a law that usually relates to, for our purposes and coming into contact, if we ever have a canister, okay? So if you ever have a canister, a scuba tank or an oxygen canister, all right, the canister is going to have some type of regulator and it's going to be a fixed volume. Okay, and so what we would normally see in our, for our purposes, is as someone is sitting here, you know, on their oxygen tank, breathing their oxygen, that if we were to go and touch the canister, the canister, as the number of molecules inside uh, are pulled out because the person is breathing and inhaling the oxygen stored in this canister, this take is going to start to feel cold, all right? And so it goes back to that as the volume here is fixed, if the particles inside, and remember the particles particles inside are in constant motion. So as they're hitting each other less and less because so many of the particles are being pulled out, that the temperature of the canister may feel really cold. And not realize that if you're breathing off of it one person, but in scuba diving, if you uh, if you open the regulator and really let that air flow out very quickly, or if you are with an emergency oxygen tank and you push the, the regulator to blow air in someone's face, um, through maybe a mass that's not fully sealed, you may find that because the particles are leaving so quickly that if you're holding the canister, the canister may feel cold. On the flip side, when we fill these canisters or we put air into them or oxygen into them, and again, if you do a scuba diving and you own your own tanks or if you're messing with oxygen and you're feeling uh, filling the uh, maybe emergency canisters that then you're taking with you on a, an aircraft or you're taking with you for the hyperbaric chamber that people are going to be on, uh, you might find that as you start to fill the tank and more and more uh, molecules are going inside and those molecules are, again, random motion chemistry hitting each other at a higher rate that the canister starts to feel hot okay now that would be one way to kind of get a gauge of again when I'm feeling my canister when the canister starts to feel hot it's getting full when the canister when I'm uh, emptying my canister and bleeding it out uh, the canister starts to feel cold and those of you again when I was in um, the Japan when I where I lived in Japan it's a huge scuba diving haven uh, and so if, if any of you end up maybe moving down to places like Miami or the Gulf Coast or Corpus Christi or the Atlantic Coast or you just you know get really big into scuba diving or you work on let's say you take a job with an offshore rig for oil drilling or underwater welding and you're the nurse on the, you know, the emergency nurse on the uh, on the dive or on the on the the oil rig for ten days or something, you may find that again you have these canisters or people are using these canisters and you get to experience that. The other side of it um, would be again if you're working in an air uh, airplane, air evac, helicopter evacuation, you'll have uh, portable oxygen containers, and you then might feel or see differences when you if if and when you have to fill or empty those canners. Okay. Now another part of this is the volume is fixed. If I put this canister in the back seat of my car and I go and park it and I'm in Vegas visiting my family, this canister 
is going to get hot. And these canisters are made of, you know, metals and materials that heat up. And as that canister heats up, remember the temperature in there is going to make the molecules warm up and get faster. And again, the molecules can warm up and get faster, heat each other at a higher rate, and that could potentially make the canister uh, a bomb that's about to go off. Because if I don't relieve the increased pressure from the molecules moving in this higher temperature at a higher rate, generating more pressure, uh, I could have a bomb on my hand where it's going to explode and the explosion is going to be in some weak point in the metal and the canister itself or usually at the seal between the canister and the regulator. Okay, so the other thing is, and again, if you're going to work in some type of uh, situation where people have emergency oxygen bottles, people have oxygen canisters, you never want to leave them in a hot place, you never want to leave them in their car, you never want to leave them in an area where they could get overheated. It's the same thing with um, the old Aquanet hairspray. Anything where there's molecules, there's a, a, a valve that's keeping the molecules in, you don't want those canisters, canisters to overheat because then per Charles's law, they can become a bomb, okay? And that's not a good thing, all right? so. Charles's Law, we just talk about it a little bit here. It's kind of like if I have a, a multiple choice question, sweetie, go ask your daddy. I'm on my school. I'm on my work uh, after at 1 o'clock, okay? You can go see your friends at 1 o'clock. Um, it's one of those things where if I need a question with A, B, C, D, I needed a law that you can kind of we can kind of talk about because it relates, but it's not really that relatable because again it relates to usually the equipment and the people, the equipment that they're using to carry their oxygen. But again, if I need four choices, it's a good fourth choice. Okay, Dalton's law. That's where we left off. All right. So if you look at the equation of what is Dalton's law, Dalton's law is that there is a total pressure, and the total pressure is the sum of the components that are present in the air. Okay, and so again, if we go back to our situation where outside air today should be 760 millimeters of pressure because we live around zero feet of seawater, and our 760 millimeters of pressure is that the partial pressure of nitrogen is somewhere around 560, the partial pressure of, or 580, I'm sorry, 580, the partial pressure of oxygen is something like 160, and the partial pressure of all the others is 8, okay? Um, and again, this is just, you know, physiology math, okay? Uh, if, let's say, again, I and my house have some ability to change the oxygen content and I made my house 50% oxygen for the air or if I'm on the ISS and I make that the atmosphere of the air of the ISS is 50% uh, oxygen. We wouldn't really want to do that because of combustion purposes but just for giggles, let's say that. Again, if I have a total pressure of 760 per Dalton's law, uh, let's say uh, half would be nitrogen or just a little bit less than half. So let's say 359 is uh, nitrogen, 359 is oxygen, and that means like two or something would be other. And again, other is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, argon, helium. So this is the law where we look at, okay, what are the components of the atmosphere? Those components are giving a part of the total. So that's why it's partial pressure. So the part of the total pressure that's nitrogen, that's partial pressure of nitrogen, is usually 78% of our atmosphere. Oxygen is 21% and all of our other ga gases are other. Okay, and as we left off last week, all right, when we start to look at what are the partial pressures when we go into our mouth and nose area versus what are the partial pressures when we get the air mixed with dead air space air, and remember dead air space air has a lot of carbon dioxide because it's the air that the carbon dioxide that came out of our blood supply is, is hanging out in, um, we are going to change the partial pressure uh, com contributors. And out of other, we're going to bring water pressure, so humidity, and we're going to bring carbon dioxide into being partial pressures that have a little bit more of a role as 
entities themselves and not just part of the other component. All right. So when we look at this equation for Dalton's law, one of the ways we apply it is Dalton's law is part of why under, under sea level pressures, the atmospheric pressure of oxygen out here is 21% and its partial pressure is around 160 millimeters of mercury out of 760 millimeters of mercury is the oxygen component. When I breathe in air, the oxygen partial pressure starts to drop. And it's going to start to drop because of Dalton's law. All right. And so your one way you could explain how Dalton's law and the physiology come together is that under ideal healthy bodies, we breathe air that's 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. And when we breathe it in and we humidify it and then we mix part of that tidal volume with our residual dead air space air, the amount of air that's getting to the alveoli is going to have a partial pressure of oxygen that has dropped from atmospheric conditions from 160 to, on average, about a partial pressure of 100. Okay, and so in this little bubble here, it's showing you the partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of water, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. What it's not showing you is the partial pressure of nitrogen and the partial pressure of other. And again, if you take what nitrogen and what other would be, all of those should equal 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Now, there's a part of me that's like, oh no, oh no, my partial pressure of oxygen, my 21% atmospheric oxygen went from 160 to 100. That's terrible. Oh my God, there's less oxygen getting to my alveoli. But here's the beautiful thing. Our physiology of our bodies is set that if we can get a partial pressure of 100 for oxygen in the alveoli, that is going to be that sweet spot pressure that when the blood comes through over the next four heartbeats and passes through the capillaries of the lungs, the blood is going to leave the lungs and head back to the left atria and ventricle, and it's going to leave with the partial pressure of 100 for oxygen in the alveoli, it's going to leave at a saturation of the hemoglobin at 98%. Meaning, if I have four little binding spots, I'm going to leave, on average, with every hemoglobin molecule bound up to four oxygens. And again, things are in constant motion, so if I say freeze, there is a chance I'm going to catch some of those oxygen and hemoglobins in a state of they were in constant motion and they separated for a split second. But I'm only going to catch about, you know, a small fraction because most of them are caught in a constant state of motion but tied together. And so that's why it's only 98%. It's really all of my all of my binding spots are bound, but again, if I say freeze and I try to capture the binding spots, how many of them are bound up? 98% of them are going to be bound up because I'm going to capture a small percentage of them in that state of separate connect, separate connect, separate connect, se and I capture it in that separation. But for the most part, they're still connected to oxygen. Okay, so this is the ideal healthy human being. Our goal is no matter where we are, no matter what's going on, we would like our partial pressure of oxygen to be 100 millimeters of pressure out of 760 in our alveoli because that is the amount of partial pressure for gradient, for pushing oxygen into our blood, into our red blood cells, binding to our hemoglobin, so when the blood over four heartbeats is heading to the left atria and left ventricle and then heading to the systemic body, all right, it is carrying maximal oxygen in a bound state to the tissues to offload and then provide the tissues the ability to make ATP, okay? So when does this become a problem, all right? If I go up in altitude, Okay, one of the things I'm going to see is that my total pressure is going to drop. And that's what this table here shows you. All right, so under, if this table and this little graph up here tells you this is sea level conditions, all right, this table tells you at 10,000 feet, 
my total pressure is now 523. Okay, my partial pressure in the alveoli, that's what the A stands for, for oxygen, is now instead of 100, it's at 60. Okay, my partial pressure in my veins for oxygen is 31. So, again, if this is my alveoli, here is my capillary. All right. Remember, this is coming from the right ventricle and the right atria and systemic veins. So this is supposed to be my deoxygenated blood. And it is coming, and the red blood cells here, all right, are not, they're like 75% to maybe 50% saturated. Okay, meaning there's not oxygen on every bound spot of the hemoglobin because the oxygen was offloaded and given to the cells. So if I take how much oxygen is bound to my red blood cells at hemoglobin and how much of it is a dissolved solute in the plasma, I'm going to see that the partial pressure of oxygen here on the venous, systemic venous side and from the right heart is somewhere around 31 millimeters of mercury at 10,000 feet, okay? And let's just go back to simple physics. If I have a pressure gradient of inside the lungs at 10,000 feet, I have 60 millimeters of pressure, and that is higher than 31, I have a pressure gradient where oxygen wants to come in and as these red blood cells leave, they want to bind up and pick up at their free one or their free two, because I'm somewhere between 75 and 50% saturation, I want to try to pick up some of that oxygen, okay? So the pressure difference, if you do the math, is like 29 millimeters of pressure. And if you look, my blood at 10,000 feet heading to my left atria and my left ventricle should be saturated at like, I think that says 87%. So that means that most of my red blood cells are going to be full with four oxygen bound, 100%, and then there'll be some that only have three at 75%. And the percentage of the ones at full are going to probably be more than the ones at 75. So I across all my red blood cells, see on average, I'm at 85% saturation of my hemoglobin spots, okay? Now, 80, 80, I'm sorry, 87%. Now, 87% is a lot of oxygen, but when I deliver that to the tissues, it might start to put me at just a few oxygen shy of meeting the demands of my tissue. And that's why we say hypoxia can start to set in, meaning I have oxygen, but I don't have sufficient amounts. And so around 10,000, and then if you see the next one is 18,000, now I'm at half an atmosphere, I would start to probably see hypoxia set in. And again, we talked about that. We showed those videos. And people will just slowly start to not fully maybe process what's being asked, process what they want to say, be able to say something, be able to continue to do some motor patterns and movements as the oxygen available and making of ATP is not happening, okay? And so that's part of the reason why when we go to places um, where we're going to jump big altitude jumps like flying or if we were to go to certain uh, situations, we might need to be on supplemental oxygen. Okay. Again, if you live in those environments, there are some adaptions that take place. And we're not going to be able to hit all the adaptions, but just know that some of the adaptions will take place where you'll do a better job at making 31, maybe like 25. And so you get that pressure gradient to widen, and that'll help you unload better. You'll make more red blood cells. So this is why athletes go to altitude train. So instead of having 5 million red blood cells per microliter, I'll make 5.3 million red blood cells. And if I have 0.3 million more red blood cells, I am able to carry that much more oxygen that then is delivered to the tissues. So there are ways that the body, if given time and ability, will try to adapt and compensate but if I was today to go from sea level and just jump up to Pike's Peak at 14,000 feet, I'm probably going to be a little hypoxic because every breath I take up there, I'm taking where 
my partial pressure between oxygen and my alveoli and the partial pressure of oxygen coming back from my veins is lower than what it was at sea level and I don't have as many red blood cells as if I did this slowly uh, and so I'm not going to be sufficiently delivering oxygen so I wouldn't ask me to take a test uh, up there where I have to use a lot of mental capability and I wouldn't ask me to maybe run a mile and expect the time to be wonderful because again I'm not ready to do that kind of oxygen dependent performance mental or physical uh, when I jump up to 14,000 feet okay so one of the things about Dalton's law then it describes and it has an explanation for why as humans there's a certain point in the atmosphere where we do not sufficiently survive and thrive okay so usually and you can see this even in cows even 12,000 to 14,000 feet starts to be kind of a ceiling where most human communities, human cities live, all right? And part of going higher than that and not, you know, uh, and surviving and thriving is it's colder up there, there's less tree line, there's less plants, less, you know, agriculture that can grow. And second, it becomes, it's harder for our bodies uh, to survive and live in this environment where we're close to half an atmosphere uh, and we've been designed to survive at the one atmosphere level and so the oxygen that we're getting in we're constantly in a hypoxic state and so it's not the best place to thrive so if you do get into data and research you'll see that cows when they move up to altitude because of the lack of oxygen they develop this brisket this big neck muscle that outgrows and it, it's trying to compensate compensate uh, a little bit for again the lack of oxygen and then birth rates and then uh, infant viability growth of fetuses is impacted and again it goes back to you need a lot of oxygen you need a lot of ATP for cells to grow and multiply and do cell cycle and cell function and if you're not giving that to a growing cell and fetus uh, there's decreased ability for it to thrive and survive so we again um, some of our biggest and highest cities are like Leadville Colorado at 12,000 feet and there could be some data that if you were to try to go and live there tomorrow and then get pregnant and try to take your baby to term the odds of that happening you have more hurdles now because you're living at a lower oxygen environment now of course there's exceptions to the rule um, base camp at Mount Everest so Mount Everest if I remember correctly is 20 6,000 feet and I think base camp is set up around 18,000 but even for some people just getting to base camp is a is part of the okay this is my Everest adventure and then for many of the people being at base camp they still sometimes are breathing on supplemental oxygen here and there and now and then to help supplement the lack of oxygen of being at 18,000 feet and getting to base camp for Everest again if you're going to climb on the uh, Nepal side uh, can take because it's not easy to get to that can take a week to two weeks uh, of walking hiking trains donkeys and things like that all right so even base camp again mainly where you're staying is somewhere around that 18,000 still kind of close to that 12 14,000 limit where people tend to live okay Okay, um, second part of how Dalton's Law can be used, all right, or did I miss it? Okay, is related to, again, uh, this, if we are moving up in altitude, one of the things that comes into play is that water tension and carbon dioxide tend to stay fairly constant, all right? Carbon dioxide represents that you have broken down glucose you've broken carbon 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 bonds and as you break down carbon 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 bonds and split those carbons to put that energy in fate phosphate bonds you got to do something with the atom you can't just say carbon atom disappear so the carbon and the oxygen become carbon dioxide and you need to get rid of it okay so you're going to eventually breathe that out so all this carbon dioxide represents every time you took a glucose you took a fat and you broke a carbon carbon bond and took that energy and put it in ADP and made ATP okay and so this represents that you have metabolism going on you have building and breaking down of molecules right and this waste product is pretty much going to be there and you need to get rid of it all right 
the water because you need to humidify everything because you're going to go from air to liquid and you want to make sure that the oxygen in that alveolar air is already in a very liquidy environment to better facilitate that movement into the blood gas uh, blood okay so the humidity of the air these two partial pressures if you look at 40 and 47 that means whatever the total pressure is uh, on average 87 is going to be contributing from water and and dead air space carbon dioxide levels uh, when we breathe and so as we go up in altitude another part of the limit of us getting up high enough to live and breathe is that once we get up to certain altitudes where the total pressure is somewhere around 100 150 200 you know as we see up in these two values when you take away 87 millimeters of mercury from that total you're not left with much to then be divided between what is the partial pressure of the oxygen, what is the partial pressure of the nitrogen, what is the partial pressure of helium, argon, freon, and carbon monoxide and methane. All right. And so as these two things have to be accounted for and we go up and up and up in altitude, we are really not able to be up at these high altitudes very long because we don't have the partial pressure then if the gradient of oxygen coming back is still at like 30 25 we're not creating much of a gradient as we get to certain altitudes and if we get to a high enough altitude it might be let's say the total pressure is 87 well guess what you take a breath and all that partial pressure is negated with these two values and you got nothing when it comes to oxygen going into your lungs all right so the next part of Dalton's law is well, what can I do to fix that okay and that comes back to all right if I change the air I breathe to be a hundred percent oxygen or well technically like 98 percent oxygen okay um, instead of when I breathe the partial pressure of oxygen is 160 what if I made this partial pressure of oxygen if the total 760 I made this partial pressure of oxygen 750 okay and then when the air is humidified and it's um, what do you call it um, mixed with dead air space all right the partial pressure of oxygen still take 87 away from 760 again just to make the math simple let's say this is 600 okay so if I'm breathing on 100% oxygen at sea level, 600, and again, the, uh, the pressure gradient of what is the venous blood is around 30 to 40, I am definitely going to get my red blood cells fully saturated, right? Let's say I go up to 18,000 feet. The total pressure now is 360, all right? So 360, ah, didn't mean to do that stop okay the total pressure is 360 and again I'm breathing hundred percent oxygen so now the inside again just to make the math simple this is 350 all right okay I humidify it and I uh, add dead air space okay and now adding that 87 in minus my 350 uh, this is to I don't even know 260 for partial pressure of oxygen okay so now I'm at 18,000 feet but because I'm breathing hundred percent oxygen the partial pressure of oxygen in my alveoli is at 260 not what it shows down here at just 60 and I'm still putting a gradient of 260 versus 31 to 40 and I'm getting my oxygen into my red blood cells and leaving my right heart right lungs left lungs into my ventricle now with 98% saturation All right if I keep going and I make again I'm up at let's say 25,000 feet and my total pressure is you know according to this somewhere around 282 all right so when I'm breathing in this is 280 let's just say and when I take away 87 this is oh my god that's 
let's just make it easy, 190 for oxygen. Again, now I'm at 25,000 feet, breathing 100% oxygen. I'm getting my saturation back up to what it should be, 98% saturated, because I'm breathing that 100% oxygen. So Dalton's Law, if we use it and manipulate it to breathe more oxygen-rich air, it is part of how we get to overcome the... Uh, problems that the atmospheric air has of not letting us be at 22, 25, 35,000 feet and mentally coherent, all right, and not in a hypoxic state, all right. Now, if I have someone who has a diseased lung, okay, if there are more spaces of alveoli that are dead air, this carbon dioxide number is going to go up. All right, and as it goes up, let's just make it an even 100. All right, this number is potentially going to go down, okay, and it might go down to 60. Okay, so someone who has had a tumor, has a uh, um, COPD, has emphysema, has all types of restricted or obstructive diseases, okay, they are going to potentially have more areas of their lungs that are not going to get air exchange and those areas are going to be still filled with air and that air is going to then be more dead space that's more rich in carbon dioxide and the waste. All right. And when we do breathe and we bring air in, less of the air is getting into the alveoli, so less of the air is then getting to interact with our blood. Right? And as that happens and the carbon dioxide levels go up, again, just the simple math, if the carbon dioxide levels are up because I have more dead air space, more residual volume, the oxygen partial pressure that I'm breathing without any supplemental on is going to go down. And then that can lead to me sitting here with my lung disease being slightly hypoxic. And that's why I joked about if you ever have some old folks who have a lot of lung compromised lung or lung disease issues, if they're not always on their oxygen tubes, always breathing in the extra oxygen to get that partial pressure of oxygen up back towards 100, uh, they could go hypoxic when the oxygen tube gets kinked, when the tank gets empty. You have to be, as their caretaker, aware of that when they start acting weird or acting funny or not coherent and, uh, and make the change or fix their oxygen tank connections. Okay, So those are how, how Dalton Law apply. All right? It can be applied for why humans were limited to go up and live at certain altitudes, why we potentially with lung disease can't be fully coherent and we're in a constant state of hypoxic if we're not on supplemental oxygen, and it explains how supplemental oxygen helps those on lung disease live at uh, normal levels. It also helps us explain why if we have supplemental oxygen, we can go up to high altitudes altitudes or cabin pressurized altitudes and actually still be coherent and still be fully functional because we can make that air under this low pressure sufficient to still get oxygen to our red blood cells. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll hit the uh, pulmonary function test in lab. So I'm going to leave that and I'm going to go to our last law, which is Henry's law. Now, Henry's law is going to be that how much partial pressure of a gas in the air there is is going to influence how much of the gas is going to be pushed into solution. Now, when we're talking about solution, we're talking about how much of the oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to be solutes in your blood. So, in blood, most of the blood the oxygen is bound up in the red blood cells. Okay, so hemoglobin is going to bind it up and oxygen gas is bound up as oxyhemoglobin. There is a little bit of oxygen dissolved in the plasma, and it's there with sodium ions, it's there with glucose, it's there with amino acids, all right? Henry's law is going to be about these oxygen molecules. The oxygen molecules not in your red blood cells, but the oxygen molecules that are plasma solutes, all right? And on average, all of our oxygen that we can gets bound up to hemoglobin and very little of it is actually a dissolved gas 
a solute floating in the plasma with the water, with the nitrogen, with the amino acids, with glucose, with sodium, with potassium, with calcium, with phosphates, with 5-carbonate, and with hydrogen ions. Okay? But what Henry's Law tells us is that if we change the partial pressure of the gas above the liquid, we can make oxygen, we can make carbon dioxide, we can make nitrogen, we can make any of those gases, uh, the molecules that get pushed into the plasma, we can make those ratios change. Okay? All right. So, under atmospheric conditions, if the oxygen partial pressure is 160 out here, again, in the alveoli, the oxygen partial pressure is 100, the amount of oxygen that's pushed into the solution is a small amount. Most of it is pulled in and tied up with red blood cells and hemoglobin, so there is a little bit of oxygen in the fluid. But what we see is if we were to go on 100% oxygen and that partial pressure of oxygen becomes instead, let's say, 300, because we're breathing oxygen through tubes in our nose, that would make more of the oxygen, again, pushed into the solution. There's no more ability to push oxygen on the red blood cells because when we were at 100, the red blood cells were 98% saturated. So one of the things about Henry's Law on oxygen is we're not actually making the red blood cells carry more oxygen because that is already maxed out. So if we raise the partial pressure of oxygen through tubes in our nose or an oxygen mask and we're healthy people, uh, putting more, again, oxygen available at sea level is not going to make your red blood cells carry more oxygen. That's already maxed out with 100 millimeters of pressure. But what it is going to make your blood do is it's going to carry more oxygen as a dissolved gas. And that means that technically, is there more oxygen now in your blood? Yes. But more of it is now tied in as a dissolved gas and more of it is brought to your tissues. Okay. On the flip side, all right, carbon dioxide in our cells is going to be very, very rich, and it's going to go into the blood, and it's going to be dissolve, a dissolved gas in our blood. All right. And if we depended on just carbon dioxide dissolved in the plasma of our fluids to be how we got carbon dioxide out, we would never carry enough carbon dioxide out. So some carbon dioxide is going to go into the red blood cells and bind those empty spots that oxygen vacated, and some of it's going to undergo a change in the red blood cell where it's going to bind with water and then form hydrogen and bicarbonate ions and those hydrogen and bicarbonate ions, again, because they're technically not carbon dioxide, are going to help us bring more carbon dioxide per diffusion into the bloodstream. Okay? Now, for soda cans, this, if I take the liquid, right now the air above it has a partial pressure of carbon dioxide that's less than 1% of the atmosphere. So that might be a millimeter pressure, if I wanted to measure it, of like one millimeter of mercury. Okay? Um, so when I made this fluid, I, in a sealed container, I put the partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide to be, let's say, 3%. So let's say 3% of... Uh, 760, I don't know what it is, but let's say that is 21 millimeters of mercury. So because the partial pressure was 21 millimeters of mercury, carbon dioxide was pushed into the fluid and it became a solute in my soda at a partial pressure equivalent of 21% of the air above it. When I sealed it, I locked in that that carbon dioxide is part of that solution. And then when I pop the can, now that the outside environment has a millimeter of carbon dioxide partial pressure of 1, but inside the fluid there's 21 millimeters of mercury pressure, I have a gradient of 21 versus 1, carbon dioxide comes out. And it comes out so quickly and at such a high rate that it forms fizz, it forms bubbles. Okay, much of how Henry's law is typically described as a physiological issue is related to nitrogen. Nitrogen, I'm like, what? Nitrogen is 78% of our atmosphere, and we, a lot of times in respiratory physiology, forget about it. But what we learned was when people go 
work at deep depths. So they were welding and building bridges and they were caisson workers. The caissons described that they were in this chamber and they would go down and then they would weld and dig and create piles and piers or they were uh, miners and they would dig and they would mine down into these deep depths. All right? We found that because every 33 feet of seawater of depth was one atmosphere, they might be working at you know 200 feet below the surface of sea level and they might be working at five atmospheres worth of pressure. And five atmosphere worth of pressure after eight hours of breathing and working in your 70% water meant I unloaded a bunch of oxygen, uh, nitrogen and oxygen, but nitrogen. Okay. And then when I went to the elevator and took the elevator up back to sea level, as I'm coming up, the pressure outside of me is decreasing. Now I'm like a soda can. I am water, 70% body water, saturated with five times the amount of nitrogen of the atmosphere, and I'm going up to an atmospheric pressure where it's one nitrogen atmospheric level, and I am now the soda can, and nitrogen can come out. And when that happens, and it forms bubbles in your blood, and what's really cool, you can go and do some research on YouTube for uh, decompression sickness, nitrogen bubbles in the heart, and they show echoes where the bubbles are going through the heart. Now, just because you have bubbles of nitrogen forming in your blood plasma, that doesn't mean you have symptoms, but eventually if the bubbles get big enough or if there are enough bubbles because the gradient is so great those bubbles can get lodged in your capillaries can try to start getting out through your skin can try to get lodged in capillaries in your brain in your nervous system in your lungs and they can form uh, pain in the joints which would be called the bends because then you bend over because you're in pain they can cause skin irritations and rashes or they can cause an embolism and block off, again, air, gas interchange in your lungs, which can then lead to respiratory distress. Or they can cause neurological symptoms that look like strokes. All right? And again, when I worked in hyperbaric medicine, what we did was if people scuba dived, and again, scuba diving, they go down to 100 feet, they're on their tank, their tank is giving them air, and that air is now, you know, three or four times the amount of nitrogen and oxygen coming into their system as they're swimming, and then they jump up to the surface, and they don't go slow, and they don't breathe out and exhale out the nitrogen, so when they surface and they take a few breaths, all this nitrogen is like a soda can fizzing and trying to get out of them. And we had this one guy come in, and again, he was limping, and he was in a lot of pain, and he was having uh, some issues with his feeling in his penis and his feeling in his toes because some of the bubbles potentially lodged in and around the spinal cord and the nerves and his lower legs and his genital region. And we put him in a dive chamber. And so the dive chamber, what you do is you go back down simulated to depth and then you breathe oxygen for periods and you're trying to offload that nitrogen gas and not take it back on with oxygen periods of thing and then you slowly come up and he walked out of there and there weren't any long-term neurological issues but you might hear about Henry's Law more with scuba diving and with work related to deep dives underwater training and or deep kind of um, again pressure gradient type work okay but for us hyperbaric medicine is another way we can apply Henry's Law so in Henry's Law, when I use depth and I breathe oxygen, I'm going to be unloading nitrogen. But if then I put oxygen mask on and I breathe 100% oxygen at 100 feet of sea level water, you know, depth, I am going to make the oxygen super, super high in my alveoli per Dalton's Law. And I'm going to make per Henry's Law, that partial pressure is so high, I am going to get more oxygen into my blood as a plasma solute. And so when I deliver my blood to my tissues, again, the, the, the red blood cells are going to be at 98% at sea level, so they're already at 98%, but now I'm delivering more from the plasma, and that oxygen under higher pressure has been shown to help healing, to help cells regrow and replenish and stay alive, and that's why hyperbaric medicine works. Okay, so Henry's Law is a little bit of the theory behind why we 
put people under pressure and breathe oxygen to get more oxygen per Henry's law into solution to be carried by our blood supply with our red blood cells already maxed out to get total blood oxygen delivery up and that oxygen under higher partial pressure has a healing effect all right, for our body and for our cells. Again, I haven't looked into it in a while, but I don't know exactly the mechanism, but it's a slippery slope because too much 100% oxygen under too much pressure and it can turn a switch and become oxygen toxicity. And I think I told you to go look up those videos where the Marines or the Navy people in the chambers and they're like at two, 300 feet breathing 100% oxygen, they went like violent, crazy, like episodes and then they 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 kind of cleanse the air they flush the air out of oxygen rich air to just normal air and then all of a sudden the people like got back towards normal really quickly and had a little amnesia of what they were doing okay all right why do we care about partial pressure so why do I care about the partial pressure per Dalton's law of the air in the alveoli because it all comes down to getting oxygen to move from the atmosphere into my blood is about pressure gradients and I need a pressure gradient for most of us the pressure gradient I'm trying to get is 100 for oxygen all right in my lungs because I know the blood coming from the body coming back is going to be somewhere of a partial pressure of 40 to maybe 30 for oxygen depending upon how active I am. So right now I'm sitting here talking to you, the partial pressure of oxygen coming back to my heart and then into my lungs is probably 40. But if I was like doing a little treadmill run as I was talking to you, maybe that partial pressure of oxygen coming back into my lungs would be somewhere around 35, 30, or 28, depending on how fast and how much activity I was doing. Okay, And that partial pressure gradient of 100 on average for most normal healthy people breathing sea level air versus partial pressure of oxygen from venous air, which is still between 75 and 50 percent saturated for most of our red blood cells of 30, 40, all right? That 60 difference of millimeter pressure gradient is enough for typically all of our bodies to adequately get the oxygen, bind to 98 percent saturation, get some oxygen into solution for plasma, leave and head to the left ventricle and head to the systemic arteries, full up oxygen capable of delivering the oxygen for all the cells to adequately have normal function. Okay. On the flip side, our carbon dioxide levels in our, um, in our air are usually going to be around that 45 millimeters of pressure. And again, if your residual volume, if you have more disease, more spaces that are not going to exchange air, that could go up a little bit. If, um, okay, so that's that. And then in your blood, the carbon dioxide might be 48, it might be 50, all right? Um, I'm sorry, in the lungs, it'll be 40. 40 on average and then again depending upon activity if I am again exercising and I'm using more glucose it might be 48 or 50 uh, the carbon dioxide on average might be again sitting here happy 45 millimeters of mercury so one of the big differences is carbon dioxide and oxygen gas are different molecules okay and so their pressure grades are a little different I have a pressure gradient of 100 versus 40, so about 60 millimeters of pressure to get oxygen in. To get carbon dioxide out, I have a pressure gradient of 5 to 10, 40 to 45, 35 to 45, 36 to 47. You know, something that's like not as big a gradient. And that is okay. As long as there is a gradient that lets oxygen oxygen is higher outside versus the blood and oxygen comes in and as long as the gradient is carbon dioxide in the blood is greater than the, the, the alveolar air and eventually the atmospheric air and carbon dioxide goes out that is what matters all right because that is then setting up that the body with every breath takes oxygen in and lets carbon dioxide out okay just because the gradients and the 
differences in the pressures, a 5 to 10 millimeter pressure for carbon dioxide, and I want 60 to 65 millimeters of pressure difference for oxygen, that just comes back to oxygen as a molecule is a little different from carbon dioxide as a molecule. This one has two atoms of oxygen, this one has a carbon and two atoms of oxygen, so it's going to be a little different, it's going to act a little differently. That's what makes them different molecules. Okay. The other things that come into play to help facilitate, again, oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide going out, is that I want to make this the distance that they have to cross as well as possible. So remember how we talked about there's an endothelial cell, there's a little bit of space, and then there's the endothelial over here. There's an endothelial cell, and then there's the alveolar simple squamous cell, and then there's a little bit of uh, air, uh, wet space between them, and the distance that is between the air and the blood is like five miles or less. That is so in the period of time that blood is moving through my capillary, again, because I have four beats happening for every breath, so I need to get 60 mils of fluid through this capillary uh, quickly, but as it moves through, that small distance lets the, the great and the move of oxygen and carbon dioxide, all right, happen so that when the blood leaves, the partial pressure of oxygen tied to red blood cells and dissolved in my plasma is equivalent to what it was in the air, which was a partial pressure of 100. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, again, the amount tied to hemoglobin, the amount tied to uh, chemically changed to, to, to bicarbonate and hydrogens, and the amount that's dissolved as just free-floating carbon dioxide molecules, that is a total partial pressure of 40, which is what it was in the air, the dead air mix of alve and alveoli air, all right? And so the, the takeaway is I need a lot of this surface area. That's why I have a long capillary surface area that's somewhere near that tennis court kind of analogy. I need a lot of that space to be as small as possible, all right? And I need these gases to be molecules that are small, that are water-soluble, lipid-soluble, so they more easily move across epithelial plasma membranes, areolar connective tissue water, a cytoplasm and membranes of mesothelial cells and etc. Okay, um, and, and then I keep these gradients as best I can. And when the gradients decrease, again, whether that's going in altitude or whatever, I uh, I have to try to find ways to compensate if given time or change the ratios, change back the gradients by breathing 100% oxygen. Okay. Okay, last point to make is again, oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to travel in the blood supply uh, in similar ways, but ratio of how they're going to travel is going to be a little different because again, they're different molecules. The oxygen that's going to be carried in my blood is going to be carried in two manners. Most of it is going to be bound to hemoglobin. And again, going back to chapter 19, that's why the red blood makes a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of hemoglobin. Every hemoglobin molecule has those four binding spots. So oxygen is going to bind four oxygens for one hemoglobin. And I got a crap load of hemoglobin in one cell. And I got a crap load of red blood cells in one microliter of blood. Okay. And the little bit of oxygen not carried that way is per Henry's law dissolved in a solute in the water of the plasma, all right? Together, what's bound and what's free, a partial pressure, hopefully 100 millimeters of mercury is what blood leaves the lungs and heads to the left heart, okay? And again, when I'm coming back, and when I unload the tissues, the tissues are going to, again, try to bind oxygen and muscles to myoglobin, trying to take oxygen and bind it up with uh, electrons and hydrogens into water. So the partial pressure of oxygen in my tissues, depending upon, again, 
how much activity might be 20 might be 40 and I have this gradient of my partial pressure of oxygen in a bound and a dissolved form is a hundred these cells have oxygen at a 20 to 40 level so I offload and let oxygen in that second it's not attached to hemoglobin go oh I'm needed over here and it leaves okay and so that gradient of getting oxygen in that delta P of 60 is part of how I get oxygen into the blood and then part of how when I get to the tissues the tissues will have a need for oxygen and then that partial pressure now bound and dissolved is greater than what the partial pressure of oxygen is in the cells and it will help on float it right carbon dioxide again it's 40 uh, here in the in the alveoli it crosses over now Hemoglobin can bind oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, but remember that most of the hemoglobin in the blood is trying to bind up the oxygen. So the carbon dioxide is going to be bound to hemoglobin sometimes, and there's space available. So it's kind of like have a group of four chairs. Most of the time, three chairs are filled. So when I can, I'll put carbon dioxide in the fourth chair and bind it to hemoglobin when that's available. Okay. Otherwise, the way I carry carbon dioxide is I do dissolve some of it, same thing as Henry's Law tells me, but the best way for me to try to get a lot of carbon dioxide in my stream is to utilize the equation that if I take carbon dioxide and I put it in water, those two molecules are going to form carbonic acid. And carbonic acid, again, per acids definition of being in water are going to separate into hydrogen and carbon uh, bicarbonate molecules All right and then to keep the cell from getting again acidic because I'm making carbon dioxide and water into an acid I'll take those hydrogens and I'll bind them wherever I can in my protein structures that can absorb hydrogens and that's why amino acids and hemoglobin are so important in the red blood cell to help kind of tie up and keep the pH of it at a normal level and what I can't tie up I will uh, again try to uh, kick out and I'll kick out the bicarb using a chloride shift and uh, and basically keep some of this carbon dioxide in its other form as hydrogen and bicarb molecules and carry more of those molecules in my bloodstream okay now because most of my carbon dioxide is chemically made into hydrogen and bicarb when I get to the lungs I'm gonna need to reverse those reactions so I can get carbon dioxide to leave as a gas and in doing so I potentially create um, a little bit of water molecules which when we get to the urinary and then acid base all of this of what's going on is going to be important in how do I create some water and how do I have buffers and how do I make and create hydrogen ions okay so the respiratory system is one of the ways we regulate our acidity and help get rid of acid in the form of carbon dioxide all right and it's also a way that we could potentially uh, create water when we don't get water through uh, food and, and diet um, and it's a way that we can create a buffer with more bicarb that we then keep or dump um, depending on the kidneys of uh, necessity okay so, ox carry two ways, bound to hemoglobin or as a dissolved gas. Carbon dioxide, three ways, most of it being not the way oxygen is carried, but by a chemical relationship of carbon dioxide and water forming acid and base, bicarb and hydrogen ions. Okay? All right, so the last thing we need to hit on, and we'll do this Wednesday, um, we'll re hit again how hemoglobin binds oxygen, and we'll talk about biochemistry, uh, a molecule when it has binding and when it, it has um, kinetics, uh, the curve, the kinetic curve, and again, how we work in the range up here versus the range down here. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that.